So this time uh, we're gonna work on uh, private finance. Okay, so uh, the previous uh, time you had me here, we were on public finance, moving to private finance. And <clears throat> again, uh, here we're gonna look at the work of Hyman Minsky, okay? And um, a specific part of his work, which looks at, uh, I guess I'm gonna remove this, uh, which looks at the um, stages of capitalism. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> so, is he, okay. so the first part we'll look at what these are. So we um, and then move to um, managerial capitalism a bit more, the transition to uh, money manager capitalism and um, well, where we are today, basically, and the properties of that stage and how similar it is to a previous uh, stage of capitalism. Okay, the point here is to show that um, there has been a growing financial instability over the past few decades, and uh, we want to try to understand why that happened. And so we'll do it here through the stages of uh, capitalism. So uh, Minsky, um, toward the later part of his career, uh, looked at um, how capitalism changes over time and from the point of view of finance. Okay. Um, and he has four uh, stages of capitalism, commercial, finance, managerial, and money manager. Uh, the main difference between the uh, different stages is how uh, bankers are involved in the uh, financing of the economy. Okay. So in the first stage, okay, um, we have mercantilism, commerce, and so we want to here emphasize uh, the funding of commerce. Okay. Finance capitalism, <clears throat> here uh, we have the rise of, well, you have the in, uh, industrial revolution um, and so heavy equipment need to be uh, financed and so you have the rise of investment banks and the growth of um, funding channels that involve long-term financing. Uh, <clears throat> that stage uh, was quite, and we'll look at some data about that, that stage was quite unstable. Okay. Uh, this is followed following the uh, Great Depression by uh, managerial capitalism, okay, and uh, where you have a retreat of bankers and a rise of government in uh, the economy, okay, and it's um, government is involved through several channels. We'll look at those, uh, but the main property of this uh, stage is that it's a stable, um, it's a stable stage. Uh, and finally, we have a return of instability uh, starting in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, okay, with um, money manager capitalism. And so um, here you have a return of finance as crucial okay, for the economy. Uh, a lot of work has been done in relation to that called the financialization of the economy. Okay, so. Minsky talked about money managers instead, but that's the same idea. And so uh, with a return of instability, okay, we're gonna have to explain why that, that happens and how different uh, the system is compared to the stage of finance capitalism. So uh, managerial capitalism, there are several aspects to it. Um, in terms of first banking, okay, we are remember here following the uh, Great Depression. And so following the Great Depression, we have a set of regulations that are put in place to try to um, create some stability in the banking system. Okay. Um, and uh, so we separate banking activities. Okay between commercial and investment banking. We create a barrier here. Uh, we also have changes in the um, uh, Federal Reserve Act, okay, uh, where 
basically the central bank, um, as I told you last time, okay, the central bank was, at least the Federal Reserve, uh, was created in 19, uh, December 1913, okay, and um, well, the implementation uh, was um, supposed to have an elastic currency, that is, you can add and remove reserves on demand. Well, in practice, the uh, central bank didn't do that because it uh, constrained itself in terms of the types of assets it would buy from uh, banks. Okay, There was a fear that having a perfectly elastic uh, supply of reserve would create inflation. And so we wanted to uh, link the ability to create a reserve to the productive uh, uh, needs of the economy. Okay, and so that limited um, what uh, the central bank decided to buy. So what was called the real bill doctrine. Okay, and so they would only buy certain types of uh, uh, securities from um, banks. Uh, as time goes on, it turns out that this didn't work. And by the time of the Great Depression, they really had to change that. Okay, they also had to depreciate relative to gold, and Ultimately, uh, what we have here is a uh, central bank that truly provide uh, reserves on demand, mm -hmm. okay? And the goal is interest rate stability, okay? You want to maintain interest rate stable. Um, you don't use, um, well, that's it. Um, also on the um, uh, banking side, the business of banking, uh, loan officers, which are the one who are in charge of basically providing credit, okay, um, and so they're in front of a client, and before you provide credit, uh, where well, you're supposed to check credit worthiness, that is, do you have a job, do you have an income, do you have any collateral, things like that, okay, and we're going to verify what you're telling us, okay, these loan officers do their job properly, okay, and they're paid uh, through salary. And so you don't have a remuneration based on how the quantity of uh, credit you provide, but rather on the quality. As if you do jo your job well, you'll stay with the bank. Okay. And so with that, uh, you have underwriting, that is the process of checking the credit worthiness of a client that is done well. Um, an officer gained a lot of experience they um, try to have, promote uh, safe financial practices and recurring financial practices with their clients. Okay, and so all of that promotes basically um, financial stability. Uh, in terms of government, uh, we have um, large increase in our regulation. Okay, so SEC, FDIC, okay, Glass-Steagall Act. Okay, all of these that are passed. And also, you have a much larger involvement of uh, the government in the economy. Okay, if you could look prior to um, the 1930s, uh, the size of, again, looking at the United States, uh, if you look at the size of government spending in the economy, it's about 2% of GDP. So it's quite small. Okay. Basically, it's postal service, the army, the police, legal system, and that, that's basically it. Okay. Uh, with the uh, Great Depression, you start to have a rise in uh, the size of government spending in the economy. And um, so that helps to stabilize the economy okay, because it helps basically to stabilize private income. Okay, remember back to the sectoral balance. Mm -hmm. okay, if you spend more in the economy as a government, that creates surplus in uh, the rest of the economy. Okay. <clears throat> Um, you also have um, automatic stabilizers that are created, Social Security in 1937, okay, where uh, prior to the, um, uh, uh, that time, if you get unemployed, well, good luck, okay, you have no sources of income, okay, uh, if you are retired, okay, good luck again, and so um, Social Security helps to uh, soften the blow of not working. Okay, and so still provides income where previously basically 
you don't have any if you stop working. So if you do that, you also help to sustain economic activity because people have some money to spend. Okay, and so um, this is an automatic stabilizer. Why? Because it, this spending will rise automatically in a recession and will fall during an expansion, which limits inflationary pressures on the other side. Okay. Uh, in terms of labor market, here we have um, also shared prosperity, okay, uh, where um, wage uh, basically keep up with productivity. And if you, uh, as we move forward, we'll see there is a break in uh, that relation uh, in the 1970s, where basically real wage starts to be stagnant and productivity shoots up and there is a delinkage between the two, but here it keeps up. Um, you have tremendous gains by uh, workers, okay? And um, overall, um, most incomes see an improvement, most households see an improvement in their income, okay? And so with this, um, and uh, coupled with greater help by the government, you're going to have a limited need to use debt uh, to basically maintain your standard of living. Okay? Uh, the main reason you would yet use debt here in that case would be uh, mostly to finance house purchase. Okay, but credit cards, no. Um, and so you have a limited use of debt. Um, so um, here is uh, some data that looks at um, the structure of assets of banks. Okay, and so, well, uh, the interesting part actually for us is uh, the very beginning around 1945, okay, where um, we'll see that uh, the greatest <laughs> proportion of assets in the bank's balance sheets are US treasuries, okay? So uh, by the end of the war, okay, um, roughly, what, 60% of banks' assets are composed of treasuries, okay? And so they have a large pool of um, highly liquid, highly secured um, um, assets in their balance sheet. And so that makes them quite stable. Over time, okay, the, uh, the banks return to the private financing of the economy. Mortgage, of course, is the main one and um, the proportion of treasuries falls. And with that, uh, we're gonna have some development that occur. Uh, here is um, a graph that, that made Pavlina famous, uh, and that looks at um, the, uh, how uh, basically uh, when you have economic growth, how the gain of income is distributed among um, the population, okay? So um, let's say uh, you have a period of expansion, okay? And during that period of expansion, uh, national income grows by $100, okay? And so the question is, who gets that? Uh, how is that $100 extra distributed, okay? Well, uh, until basically the um, 1980s, uh, most of the income gains during an expansion would go to uh, the bottom 99%, okay? And uh, if you go to uh, other data, bottom 90%, okay? So most of the gain would go um, toward basically a broader segments of, the, broad segments of the population. As we move through time and start from the 80s, 90s, 2000s, what we see is a change in the way um, income gains over an expansion are distributed, where we move basically toward top um, income earners capturing most of the income gains mm -hmm. during an expansion, okay? And so we are moving away uh, definitely uh, from ch shared prosperity. Um, here we have, um, so we're done with uh, managerial capitalism. So the, that period is a period of stability, okay? Due to, again, the limited use of debt by households and uh, firms, uh, heavy involvement of government in the economy both in several ways, spending, regulatory, supervisory, um, and banks that are um, having incentives to provide credit in uh, 
way that is safe. Okay. Now, um, Minsky, remember the idea of Minsky is that stability breeds instability. Okay, that is periods of economic stability uh, create the condition for instability to occur. And so how do we move to a um, form of capitalism we, where we see recurring uh, crises? Okay. Well, um, the transition toward uh, money manager capitalism um, starts in the banking system, <clears throat> where um, if you have uh, prosperity, well, people are able to save, okay? And uh, if they are able to save, well, they're going to try to make that money work for them, okay? And so you have a growth of um, financial institutions that are involved in basically using these savings and try to maximize a return on that. So the rise of pension funds and the rise of mutual funds, okay, over uh, that period of time. So here we're talking 1970s, okay. Oh, uh, um, and a bit earlier too. Uh, also during that period, you have very small deficits. You have periods of surplus, limits, a few of them. And um, banks are growing their asset position. So um, as I showed you in the previous graph, banks are moving uh, toward financing the economy. So greater proportions of their uh, assets is not US treasuries, but private debt, okay, of all, all sorts of private debt. And um, well, uh, they still need to keep some liquid assets for um, their daily uh, operations. And um, in the past, when they had enough treasuries, they could just go to the discount window and basically uh, uh, ask the Fed for credit by putting the US treasuries as collateral, okay, or selling the treasuries to the central bank. Um, here, uh, over time, as a share of treasuries, uh, shrinks okay um, banks develop new ways to um, basically uh, obtain reserves and uh, we have the rise of market oriented means of obtaining reserve and doing um, doing more with the existing amount of reserve they have and so we have uh, the fed fund market that rise and the rise of uh, basically non-fed refinancing sources okay a lot of interbank uh, basically uh, operations. And uh, so with that, you have a growing competition for uh, funds, okay? And uh, we move toward, uh, again, financial market making, um, becoming more important for banks and their routing operations. Uh, you have also an evolution in the banking, <laughs> in the banking sector, uh, where we move from uh, a commitment um, model to an originate uh, and distribute model. So um, in the first model, we talked about that uh, already, where you have the uh, loan officers, that is a person in charge of deciding who should get credit, okay, is basically at the core of the banking industry, okay? And um, the bank keeps uh, once it has accepted the uh, debt of someone, okay, a mortgage or business debt from someone, okay, they basically keep that on their balance sheet and patiently wait for the client to uh, repay while also paying interest. And so your profit comes from ensuring that the client is uh, doing um, what it promised to do uh, properly. Uh, so you want to be safe in your lending practices because you're gonna be tied to the fate of your client, okay? And so you want to establish recurring long-term relationships with your borrowers. And if there are issues, you are willing to work that out and make a deal, okay? And so you want to judge credit worthiness very carefully. We have moved toward um, something called the originate and distribute model, okay, where uh, what Minsky called position making is central. 
So the idea here being that um, banks are no longer interested in having long-term recurring relations with their clients. What they're going to do is, okay, we'll get your mortgage. Okay, so your household, you want to buy a house. Um, you uh, provide, uh, you sign an IOU called a mortgage and you give that to the bank and the bank basically doesn't want to keep it, wants to sell that off somewhere. Okay, and so to make position is to find a way basically to sell your assets to maintain your liquidity and solvency. Okay, and so um, in that case, profit no longer comes from holding onto the uh, uh, IOUs that um, you obtain from your client, but instead of finding a way to sell as quickly as possible those things, and you get earned fees. Yeah, and you earn fees from the sale and you earn a fee from what we call the servicing uh, of the um, IOU. So you pay your interest and principal monthly that servicing. And so the bank that, originate, uh, that originated the uh, credit basically still is in contact with the client, but passes most of those uh, payments to whomever bold uh, whomever bought the um, mortgage or others and minus a cut. And so the cut is the fee that they take for doing the work of collecting the funds from the clients. And so here the incentive is no longer to be careful about um, how much credit you provide. Uh, instead, uh, you want to focus on the volume origination because the more volume you can of credit you can provide <coughs> the more <coughs> the more basically you can um, earn fees from that okay and so you don't have an incentive to judge credit worthiness very carefully and uh, you go further than that you have an incentive to um, enhance credit worthiness okay and to hide uh, that you are uh, basically selling toxic stuff okay um so if you want to know more about that i can talk about that more but, uh, that would be for with the question part uh, uh also on the policy side okay the transition toward um money manager capitalism involves changes in policy okay you have um growing worry about inflation if you go back to the um uh the uh federal reserve act okay the preamble of the Federal Reserve Act says basically it's the purpose of the act is to provide uh, an elastic currency and to provide for the regulation and supervisions of banks. Mm -hmm. It makes no mention of fine tuning the economy. Okay, that was not the purpose. Okay, the purpose was not to try to raise rates when you have inflation, lower rate when you have a recession. Okay, the purpose really was to make sure that uh, you have in uh, banking system the interbank the banking system that works properly that if people come to the bank there is enough reserves and also is to make sure that uh, given we have that we don't create more hazard and uh, so we have some regulation and supervision that is done carefully by the central bank okay that's what the central bank was supposed to do um, uh, following the Treasury Accord in 1951, you have a uh, uh, greater preoccupation by the central bank in trying to fine tune the economy and to basically move interest rates with uh, inflation. And with that, you have a uh, well rising volatility of interest rates. Okay. And um, Remember the um, banking structure that is created following the um, Great Depression is one that is about holding onto assets for an extended period of time. So take a mortgage, okay, you have a household that comes in, sign the paperwork, the mortgage note, and the mortgage note says uh, over the next 30 years you'll repay that mortgage and uh, it's going to be a fixed 5% interest rate. 
Okay, so on your asset side, you have a lot of fixed rate uh, assets. Okay, and on the liability side here, uh, <clears throat> you're going to start to have interest rates that are going to start to rise much more quickly uh, and much more volatile. And so that can put uh, banks in a, a difficult position if the interest rate they earn on their asset side becomes less than the interest in there to pay on their liability side, okay? And um, so the model that was established after the Great Depression worked on the precondition that the central bank basically uh, kept interest rates stable, okay? But we are moving away from that. And um, banks to try to combat that while well, try to ask from a level playing field from competitors that are emerging and so they want deregulation on the asset side they want to try to be able to be involved in broader sets of economic activity and uh, they want also to have uh, elimination of regulations on their liability side which are um, what we'll call regulation q okay they were limited in the uh, interest rate they could uh, basically provide to their depositors. And uh, with that, well, uh, basically the um, regulations put in place in uh, the 30s following the Great Depression are no longer adequate for um, the system to work properly. Okay. <clears throat> so now uh, money manager capitalism. So we have uh, financialization, that is uh, balance sheets, okay, um, of, all, of all sectors become more dependent on um, what's going on in the financial markets, okay, and what's going on with finance, okay. And so growing use of debt, uh, you have a rising share of financial income, rising share of financial assets in the uh, balance sheets of all economy units of households to businesses, okay? And so with that, uh, the um, economic system becomes more dependent on financial markets working properly, okay? Um, banking also becomes much more globalized. Um, you start to have a rise of securitization uh, you have growing market concentration, okay? And uh, as we said, the loan officers are no longer uh, uh, the core uh, important component in the banking system, okay? And we uh, move uh, also loan officers toward um, making them grant credit based on volume rather than quality, okay? So we find someone in the street uh, to whom you can provide credit, go, okay? Um, when as far as if you go to the, prior to the, the 208 crisis, basically prisoners could obtain credit, okay? So, uh, and mo a mortgage, okay? So you have rising uh, uh, systemic risk here. Uh, also, you have a disengagement of the federal government in uh, the uh, economy, okay, where uh, most of the spending on goods and services is shifted to state and local governments, okay. So um, an example of that is, for example, the uh, funding and maintenance of infrastructures, okay, build uh, bridges, airports, sewer systems, highways, okay. All the burden of maintaining all these and expanding them is put on, or mostly on, state and local governments. Um, the problem, of course, is that state and local governments don't have monetary sovereignty. Okay. And so what we see in the United States is um, a growing, uh, um, basically, a mismanagement of infrastructures. Uh, so the American Association of uh, Civil Engineers released a report on the state of infrastructures every two years, roughly, okay, and they grade all the infrastructures in every state, okay, 
And for the United States, it's pretty dire. Okay, it's D, uh, C minus, okay, D minus, depending on the year. Okay, and we are, uh, we need over five trillion dollars of um, spending to just bring back infrastructures to an adequate level. Okay, and we need more to basically uh, keep up with the needs. Okay. Um, there, uh, next we have uh, also a decline in regulation, supervision, and enforcement, okay? um, where, uh, and that occurs in all sectors of uh, the economy, okay? Um, and uh, here we want to emphasize that uh, if you look at finance, finance is one of the most regulated sector in uh, the economy, okay? Lots of regulations by different agencies and different levels of agencies. Uh, and so it looks like things are tough, yeah. But the problem is that uh, regulation by itself uh, doesn't do much if you don't implement the regulation, okay? And so that's where supervision and enforcement become important. And so we had also issues there, okay, where basically we do not implement regulations that uh, are in, in the book, okay? I think Randy talked about the uh, fact that the uh, Fed could regulate um, uh, non-bank lender, mortgage lenders, okay, since HOIPA, uh, basically, and uh, basically they didn't use that um, that um, act, okay, she just didn't use it. Okay. The idea was that, well, markets self-regulate, that's okay, okay. And so you have a return of the view that markets do it right, markets self-correct, and so we don't really need to do anything about um, regulating through government uh, laws. You also have a deregulation of the uh, labor market, okay, where um, basically unions um, having, are having a hard time, okay, and so that puts the downward pressures on wages, and we'll look at uh, a bit later, it has an implication, of course, for inequality. You have a transfer of financial burdens uh, toward a household who have to finance their education, their health care, uh, they have to put money aside for retirement. And so a growing financial burden is put on households that are seeing depressed wages. Okay. And also, um, you see a growing, uh, especially at the top among executive, uh, a move away from uh, remunerating themselves uh, based on salary, but moving instead, uh, remuneration is based on the direction of stock prices. Okay. And so, what you're going to emphasize here is capital gains. Okay. And so, um, what we have here is stagnant income, growing use of debt, and growing reliance on uh, capital gains. Now, um, Minsky, uh, to try to understand what, how we move toward financial instability, uh, defines the, the concept of financial fragility. Okay. And so when you have growing financial fragility, uh, over time, the chance of financial instability or crisis grows. And so he uh, implements that definition by defining three categories. Okay. The, the first category is what we'll call hedge finance. And in hedge finance, the idea here is that when you obtain credit, uh, it's expected that your income will always be higher than the debt service. So that is, bankers expect that you will never have um, um, uh, difficulties to repay your debt by using your income, okay? Uh, and if you have a period of time where your income is not enough, you have plenty of uh, savings so you can use. So basically, the chance for you to have troubles is very limited. Okay. Below that, he has two other categories, speculative and Ponzi. And the main idea of these two 
is that uh, here you have problems servicing your debt with your income. And so, um, because your income is not high enough. And so what you're gonna have to do is draw down on your savings uh, or sell some assets. Okay, sell uh, some of the stocks you have, or bonds, or mm -hmm. a car, or ultimately uh, you have to sell the house. Okay, if you really can't pay. Okay. And uh, Ponzi is basically just an extreme form of that. Another way to think of these categories is um, that in a hedge finance, um, a banker provides credit based on your income, okay, an expected income. Okay. And so they carefully check if you have enough income to service the debt. Um, whereas in uh, Ponzi finance, we don't care because the uh, we don't care about income because income is never going to be large enough to service the debt. So, where how we're going to pay? Well, we're going to pay by liquidating an asset. Okay, so um, I will uh, see example um, a bit later. But um, in uh, the two thousand eight crisis, basically, um, or prior to it, um, bankers didn't verify income. Okay, and so um, they provided credit to anyone, okay, without checking. And so you wonder, well, how, how do you make money in that case? Well, the uh, business uh, um, business um, deal, I guess, was to say that, okay, we know this person is going to default, but home price are rising. And so what we're going to do is provide credit to that person. The default will put them in foreclosure. We sell the house at a higher price, so we make a capital gain, and we get our money, interest, fees, and all that stuff from the proceeds of selling the house. So here you can see that the way you provide credit is not based on the ability of the um, debtor to uh, obtain an income and progressively make the payments, but basically it's leveraged speculation. Okay, you provide credit you hope for capital gains, and then you hope that that will cover whatever you need to obtain to make a profit. Okay, and so we have growing uh, use of this kinds of banking practices. Okay, uh, so here's some data um, that looks at non financial corporate and households and uh, non profit organizations. Um, and basically you have a trend of growing um, uh, growing debt to asset up to basically 09, okay? After that, it's a decline. Here is a share of financial assets among um, three sectors, uh, non-financial corporate, non-financial, non-corporate sectors and households. And uh, basically for businesses, we see a growing share proportion of financial assets that are held on their balance sheets. For household, it has always been quite high. Um, this one shows you the share of financial asset, assets um, held by um, the different uh, sectors of the economy. And uh, the one we want to pay attention to here is this one, okay? So we have the rest of the world, which is the top. Uh, the government, which is this one, and monetary authorities, it's the Federal Reserve right here. Okay. Uh, and uh, this one is financial businesses. Okay. Uh, this comes from the uh, um, financial accounts of the United States, the one. Uh, normally, the, the monetary authorities are lumped into the financial business, but here we separate them to basically show more the private sector type of business. And you have a growing share of financial uh, assets that are held by uh, financial businesses, okay? Uh, within, I have not updated that one uh, to 2000, to, to the recent period, but uh, if you just look, uh, go back, no, I can't go back, no, yes. Um, if you now look uh, within that sector, Okay, how financial assets are distributed within the financial businesses. Uh, what you see here is um, that you have a growing share of basically um, pension funds, portfolio management, and securitization 
are uh, capturing a greater share of that okay and if you have declined share of banking uh holding banks holding most of financial assets um here is data on market concentration uh that was a pain to make that that graph especially the line so um here what we have here is uh what um looking at the proportion of bank assets that are held by the largest banks in the United States, insured banks, let's say FDIC data. And uh, so how you read the graph here, say in 1984, um, basically, uh, um, no, uh, this is, I, I'm changed, this is supposed to be over uh, 10 billion. The, this you should reverse that. The blue one is over 250 billion and the green one is over 10 million. The point is that if you look at this here, about 30% of all bank assets okay, for, from insured bank are held by banks that have a total asset over 10 billion. Okay. Um, this is looking at, again, banks that have more than $250 billion in assets. And starting in uh, the mid uh, 90s, okay, they start to capture a growing share of um, total bank assets in the banking sector. And so, whereas in the 1984, about 30% uh, of all bank assets are held by the top banks, today we have over 80% of um, bank assets that are held by the top banks. Yeah. The number of banks today that have assets over $250 billion are 13 banks, okay? And a if you combine all banks that are making, that have assets over 10 billion, they're about 3% of all banks. So over th about 3% of banks in the United States hold 80% of all uh, bank assets in the United States. So very large concentration, okay, in the United States. Uh, this one is looking at who holds the derivative contracts among all banks. And basically most, and that has always been the case, okay, most uh, derivatives are held by the top five banks, okay, in the United States. Uh, so here, this is some data about securitization. Okay, so um, remember when uh, uh, a bank provides credit, say uh, you sell a mortgage to the, you provide a mortgage uh, to the bank, well, the bank doesn't keep that mortgage on its book, it tries to sell it. Okay, so it sells it to an investment bank who finances the purchase by um, issuing mortgage-backed securities. Okay, and uh, here what we're gonna we're looking at is the issuance of asset-backed securities, which, uh, in the de definition of the industry, excludes mortgage-backed securities. They're a separate category. So what do we have here? Uh, um, early on, uh, automobiles uh, and credit cards uh, were a dominant um, form of asset-backed securities. Um, student loans have gained in proportion quite a bit, and uh, we have uh, CDOs and uh, so collateralized debt obligation and collateralized loan obligations that have become much more important, which is, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, we are at, uh, prior to the crisis, we're about $2 trillion worth of those things. Uh, then it crashed, and now it's starting to go back up, but more slowly than it did uh, prior to the crisis. Uh, so here are mortgage-backed securities. Um, and um, here uh, we have several types. Um, those that are issued by um, um, government-sponsored enterprise, so Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, okay, and or insured also by uh, those of Ginnie Mae. And um, we have private label uh, mortgage-backed securities, which are issued by non-GSEs, 
Okay. The main difference between the two is that government sponsored enterprise have to uh, meet some standards uh, in terms of credit worthiness, in terms of safety of the mortgage they buy. And so, um, whereas private label securities, they don't have to really meet these requirements. Okay. So, you don't have to, you have to have a limited loan to value ratio. You have to make sure that uh, those who um, uh, obtain credits have a high enough income. So that's for GSEs. Private labels, you don't have to have, you don't have any requirements. And so again, you have a boom of that until 2007, okay? Uh, especially private labels are growing because you have a lot of subprime and alt A mortgages that are issued and GSCs can't buy this. So um, that led to a boom in private label. Um, and um, then it for stag st um, has stagnation and then it's starting to go back up again, mostly driven by agencies. And so we are at 12 trillion for those. Um, so you have also an evolution of underwriting uh, during that period of time where we have less verification of documentation. So we have what we call the ninja loans. Again, that's a term of the industry. Ninja means no income, no job, no assets. Verification, <laughs> that's what that means. So you want to obtain credit, uh, okay, the way, uh, so... You come to see me, okay, I'm the loan officer, and uh, you say, I want to buy this million dollar home there. Okay, fine. Um, do you have any income? No. Uh, do you have a job? No. Do you have any collateral or guarantors? No. Oh, that's fine. Here, go buy the house. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, or sometimes a bank would just write a number for you, okay? So you don't, you don't need to tell me what your income is. I'll just write a number. Okay, you want to buy this million-dollar home? You need to make at least uh, $100,000 of income. Okay, we'll put $100,000, okay? I'm not asking you to provide me any W-2s. I won't verify with the IRS. I'll just put that number, okay? So, uh, yeah. You also have uh, lower margins of safety. That is, um, banks usually um, want to have some protection in case of default. Okay, One way is by checking credit worthiness, but they also want to make sure that uh, they limit the amount of funding they provide relative to the value of the house. So if the house is worth $100, okay, well, a uh, bank... Uh, uh, to be safe, will only provide up to 80% financing on that house, so up to $80, okay? Why? Because if the house value, if you get into trouble and you can't repay, we're going to go start a foreclosure process and we're going to try to sell the house. And so if you sell the house, you want to make sure that, well, um, you recover at least $80 for, so that you get back your, your money. And so having a buffer here between the value of the house that is 100 and the amount you provided 80 allows you to see a fall of 20% in housing market until you are, you are making losses on your original uh, loan. Okay. Well, here we have provide, we're pro loan to value ratio over 100%, 130, 150%. So, um, well, why? Well, People uh, go on vacation, buy a boat, whatever. Okay. And home price always go up. So the value of the house will catch up anyway. So it's all right. Okay. And you qualify people based also on a teaser rate. That is, um, at that time, okay, uh, a, a loan that a mortgage that becomes popular is one where you only pay a small interest rate and um, over time, uh, after a period of time, the interest rate resets up, okay? So for example, the first two years, you only pay a 1% interest rate. And after two years, the interest rate goes up to 6%, okay? And that's gonna be staying at 6% for the next uh, 28 years, okay? Two years at one, 20 years at six, okay? So how are we gonna judge your credit worthiness? Are you sure we do base it on the six or the one? 
Well, here we're going to do it on the one. Okay, not the six. Uh, and uh, even more than that, we're going to qualify you based on you not repaying on any of the principal, because for these first two years, you also have the option of not repaying any principal. So you just pay a small interest rate, and we're going to qualify you on that. Okay, not on the full debt service. Um, also, uh, um, you have um, growing um, decline in quality of the uh, mortgage that are provided. Okay, so, um, and you emphasize again collateral value. Okay, so home price direction is what you pay attention to. Um, you have the same thing in. Um, um, security underwriting, okay, where basically you have a growing use of um, reliance on market direction. So you have this all alphabet soup of securities, okay. And so um, to create those securities, normally you want to get a sense of, well, what is the quality of the underlying assets? So if you want to create a mortgage-backed security, okay, uh, the person who wants to do that would say, well, can I take a look at the mortgages and see uh, what quality they are? Okay. And so um, there was a uh, standard and poor boss to, uh, to ask, to told these analysts who asked this question says, no, you cannot request to see the underlying loan. This is totally unreasonable. Okay. So you're supposed to create those things without looking at if it's trash or not that is backing those things. These things, okay. Um, for the interest of time, I'm gonna go a bit faster and leave you a, a time to ask questions. So let me close quickly in a few um, minutes. I'm gonna move uh, forward a bit. The main point here is you have a growing rise of what we call Ponzi finance, okay? Um, where you have stagnant income that is, um, uh, and at the same time, you have growing use of debt. Okay, you are moving remuneration of loan officers and top executive based on loan volume and asset price direction. Okay, and uh, you have basically a growing interdependence between debt and asset prices. You have a debt inflation process. Okay, um, and so what are with that, you have growing financial instability, okay? And the main difference with the previous period, the finance capitalism of the 19, the early 20th century, is that today we have a grow, much bigger role of government. And uh, also growing debt used by financial business themselves. Um, and so uh, here I'll skip to this graph okay, that shows you the size of debt relative to GDP by sector of the economy that goes to 2017. I guess next time I could do that, I'll update again. Uh, overall, what you see is uh, total amount of debt relative to GDP in uh, during the Great Depression went up to uh, about 3%, three, three times GDP. by um, 2007, here we were at five times GDP. So you have much higher, much more pressure today on the uh, system and much more chance of debt deflation today. Uh, a main difference compared to the past, again, is private finance is much more leveraged itself, okay, through securitization, okay. Um, yes, uh, quickly. So this graph also, I guess, is um, interesting. What it shows you is um, with the decline of union membership, which is the red line, uh, this one, so here, okay, from basically the 1960s ish, okay, 50s, 60s, you have a long decline in uh, a mem union membership. With that, you see progressively a rise of uh, income inequality, okay, and that makes sense, okay, if you're not having. Um, anyone defending workers' interests, well, uh, they end up not sharing prosperity and you have a growing distribution of income and wealth also to the top. Uh, so you have a return of instability, okay? And today, 
you have much stronger instability in the system. Okay, uh, much stronger, especially the 08 crisis. Um, if we had let it go um, unplanned, like we did during the crisis, uh, the Great Depression, we would have had much stronger de deflationary forces. Okay. Um, so here is a bit of data, okay, that shows you the return of instability. Okay, we have um, so here is um, finance capitalism, okay, where they look at different types of crises, currency crisis, banking crisis, and the combo of both. Okay, and uh, how long basically uh, these crises last? And what is their impact on cumulative GDP loss? Okay, during the time of the crisis. Okay, and so you can easily see that here you have about eight between eight and ten percent GDP loss during a crisis. Okay, and when you have a twin, it's even more. Okay, and uh, same here. Okay, it's quite high instability. And then we have this period of financial uh, managerial capitalism where the duration of, you still have crises, you don't have banking crises, uh, or, and, um, but they don't last long and their impact on GDP is quite uh, limited. And then from the 1970s on, I don't know if they have updated that recently, but you have a return of instability where crises last longer and their impact on the economy is growing. It's not as strong as here, except in during twin crises. Why it's not as strong? It's because we have a bigger government. Okay. And so that helps to limit uh, the deflation practice. All right, I'll stop here and go for questions. Yes. Um, so going back to the the point of the, the shift in the bank's business model, essentially from like a um, interest rate uh, deposit spread to um, you know not really doing as much um, credit work and, and and more so fee based. So would it be correct to say that that the banks are essentially just outsourcing the, the credit work to the kind of peripheral financial system? Yeah. Not taking as much credit risk. The right. So the now the next gatekeeper was supposed to be the credit rating agencies. Okay. That uh, basically were there supposed to rate properly the securities. And to do that rating properly, you're supposed, well, of course, to check the underlying assets. We just show you um, uh, Stenner and a boss telling his CDO analyst, no, 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 you're not going to do this. Okay, you're going to provide a rating regardless of the underlying quality of the mortgage. And so we're going to create AAA securities, which are top uh, securities out of crap. Okay, and so Ninja loans, and we're going to make AAA securities out of that. Uh, and so, um, yeah, um, in addition to that, what we see is uh, during that time period, uh, competition among the rating agencies and the loosening of the standards that are used to judge credit worth, uh, to judge uh, um, credit ratings, okay, and the change in methods of rating. Also, all those securities uh, that are created, CDO, CDO Square, and all those stuff, are quite new, okay, and there's really no not, no data to judge how they're gonna behave during a crisis. Um, so we try to find proxy, make up something, uh, and issue those stuff, but there is no really strong data backing, uh, basically the idea that there are AAA. Remember a AAA, if you look at the standard corporate bond, a AAA, uh, rating means the probability of default on this, uh, the median, uh, default probability over five years is 0.02%. So basically there's zero chance almost that it's going to default. Okay, and so when you're creating AAA securities and selling those to the pension funds and hedge funds and all those, uh, well, they look at this rating as a great, okay? It has almost no chance of defaulting, and it turns out it provides a higher uh, rate of return than a standard corporate bond, 
So for the same reading, you obtain a better return. Eh, I'll buy or not. Okay. And so those were supposed to be the gatekeeper, but again, um, because of competitive forces at play uh, and incentive mechanisms in place, that didn't work out basically. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, um, well, if you look at the graph here, uh, the prior to the crisis, okay, the two main driver were households and household wide went up is mostly uh, mortgage debt that exploded here. Okay. And it's within the uh, found finance itself that you have large growth. And so here, what we have is a growth of securitization, basically, and debt on debt, basically. Um, I didn't show you that, but um, let's see if I can go back. This graph, I was able to find actually uh, the data when it was gone for a while. Let's see if it works. I tried to show you that. So. Uh, uh, ProPublica at uh, the time went to take a look at, well, so we create a CDO, okay, um, and we're good, okay, the CDO basically, um, oh, you can't see, oh, sorry, so a CDO is basically a security, it's like a bond, okay, uh, that is backed uh, by um, mortgage-backed securities, okay, and other stuff. We're good? No, we're not good. Okay, cool. And so uh, who is going to buy those things? Well, um, you'd think it's pension fund and all that stuff. Well, um, if you look at it by banks, okay, Merrill was a major uh, issuer of CDUs, and you see circles are like, flowing back to Merrill. What is going on here is basically when they created a CDO, well, they have to find a buyer for those stuff, those securities. Who was the main buyer? Were another CDO that they had created, and so you have CDOs buying CD. C, so CDO is the, the we name the entity the same name as the security they issue, like a bit like we called you mortgage instead of household because that's what you issue. Okay, so uh, here um, the CDOs basically sell, sell CDOs to other CDOs that Mirror create itself. So it's going in circle here. Okay, and uh, Citigroup did that quite a bit too. Um, and they sold CDOs to other uh, entities too. Okay, so you have a lot of going in circle type of thing here and you create a market out of basically finding a straw buyer, basically. Yeah. So that, and that of course expands leverage within finance. Yes. Yes. Uh, you said that under money manager capitalism, firms and the economic system as a whole became more sensitive to problems in the financial industry. So I'm wondering if there has been any studies, historical studies, that look and say, look, look say at industrial corporations that failed for one reason or another, and said, this group of industrial corporations failed for industrial or market reasons, whereas these industrial corporations failed because of the new financial market reasons. Mm -hmm. Do you know if any such studies have been done? No, I, I would not know about that. Yeah. Um, what I know is that um, what we have is a prior again to the crisis is within industrial corporations you have a move toward finance to for example ge general electric okay until basically 2009 most of its profit didn't come from the industrial sector same with ford okay a large chunk of its profit didn't come from selling cars okay but it came from finance insurance okay and things like that and um uh, well ge uh, recently basically decided to move away from that and 
from all that and the recenter its activity toward its industrial core basically they saw all or most of their financial activities yes so yes wondering if you looked at richard Bigg's a brief history of doom no i have not read that it, it, because it really ties from what i can tell it ties in beautifully with the growth in private debt and the lack of uh supervision of the staff approving loans right and he's gone over 200 years of that big data in several different countries like you have know, a fun analysis to do with that i guess but just to, okay it might be a direction to go sure and cool he, i think uh, he verifies what you're saying we are uh, i'm gonna shameless self-promotion uh randy and i wrote a book called the rise and fall of money manager capitalism okay so um we go over that stuff much more in depth too. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, what we we didn't we didn't talk a lot about the uh, the repeal of the class uh, people, but like what I mean, what did that have? And and you know some of the um, you know deregulatory um, action in the in the two decades prior did that have uh, like did you know, getting investment banks access to the Fed discount window, is that the right way to think about it? Like what what impact would that really have with the, that investment bank and commercial bank to combine with one? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, basically, if you go back to um, the finance capitalism stage, okay, what we have is a, a gross of what we call pump and dump uh, strategies, okay? And so um, investment bank, uh, and we see that again in the crypto market these uh, these days, okay? And so you would uh, pump a uh, stock and say, this is a great company and see I'm buying it. And you would basically use your commercial arm of your uh, banking side to purchase a lot of those stocks. And, um, and then when everybody bought them, well, when you have uh, pumped the, the market, Basically, you sell them and you sell them at a profit, but over time, it's going to crash, basically. Yeah, you have stuff like that. Yes. What is the destination you would have in mind? The what? What is the destination you would have in mind for financial regulation and financial options? Is it a return to managerial capitalism or is it something else? Yeah, so um, if you look at the... Uh, uh, what we propose in terms of regulation, the, the main goal here is to return, to return toward hedge finance, to make sure that underwriting is done properly and that um, income is a base toward which you provide credit. And so if you use that as your criteria to uh, regulate banks, uh, what that means is you're gonna have to, first of all, de-emphasize the, uh, the, uh, the emphasis on capital uh, capital regulation and liquidity ratio, those are important, but they are just buffers. You want to be much more proactive in your regulation. And um, there is some move to that in the Dodd-Frank Act. Okay, if you look at section uh, 14 of the Dodd-Frank Act that uh, some um, lobbies are trying to kill, it requires uh, banks to verify income. Okay, see how, how far off we went in the banking industry sure. that we have to require them to do that. Okay, so uh, you can put that in place. Okay, uh, make sure that underwriting is done properly. Basically, that would be um, one thing to do. Um, yeah, and you have other things, but um, we can talk about that later. But I think I have to stop here. It's 10.15, so I'll let you go. Thank you. You're welcome.